Thanks. Uh, today is Wednesday, March 1st, and this is the Hendrick Huston Board of Education meeting. Uh, the board has just returned from executive session, and now we will enter into a public session. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? As um, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda. Okay. I would like to move the superintendent's report to um, after the recognition celebration of the STEM program. All righty. All right, we're going to begin with we need, Carmen, do we need to vote on that? Yes. Okay. Um, right. I think we should do the pledge first. Yeah, do the pledge first. Okay. Yes, ma'am. 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 Yes, Pledge is done, and we're going to move the superintendent's report up um, after our recognition. Can I have a motion? So I make the motion. Second. Second. All in favor? All right. Wonderful. So we're going to start this evening with uh, Ms. Ms. Boyle and the STEM program, and they are going to come up and give us a demonstration. Hi everybody. Um, so I'm part of the strategic planning and we were talking about increasing communication with the community and getting you guys to see what the kids do in school. And I have really good photos from my class. So they are here to teach you about coding in fourth and fifth grade. So I think we're on the slide or so the kids that were up there are listed different names here. Tell us your name. Hi, my name is Mabel G. Michelle. I'm in the fifth grade. Hi, my name is Mabel Michelle. I'm in fourth grade. Hi, my name is Violet Santaka. I'm in the fifth grade. Hi, my name is Lachlan Carroy. I'm in the fifth grade. Um, so we use block based programming in STEM. We use Scratch and Sphere. That's what we're going to use today. Lachlan, do you want to tell us what block based means? Block based means you build the coding with building blocks. Like Legos, you can type in the numbers you need and put the blocks together to make code. So it's not in the middle school they'll be writing like using JavaScript or different programs, but in elementary school they're using block-based programs. So I talk to them about how it's like Legos and they put the things together. Um, okay, so the first one we don't have to demonstrate today it would take a really long time. Um, Lego for Education is funded through the PTA grants. So what they do is they build a Lego project. Right now it's directed Lego projects, but I've had kids that have built their own project. Then they connect it to a battery and they can code it to move. So there are kids that have made cars, they make Ferris wheels, and they follow step by step how to make it, and then they code it on the iPad. Um, the ABC class is really like this, and it's a really good way for them to see what they make, because sometimes I think when it's on the computer, they don't necessarily have the touch and like the hands-on feeling. So when they do this, they get to see that they actually can create something that'll move. Okay, so scratch coding is the one that they use in third through fifth, second, or K and two use scratch junior. So scratch coding is the program that I would love to say that I'm the best expert in, but I'm not, it's Lachlan. <laughs> um, and the other kids whose pro projects I'm gonna show you today, I started the year showing them how to do scratch coding and I stopped helping them after like a week because they went home and they were like, look what I made, look what I did. And the game I'm gonna show you, I did not help them with. They made it all on their own and now they have a platform um, that we use. They have, can have a classroom that they can share games with each other. So they shared this game and it is the most popular game at Furnace Woods. <laughs> so, um, oh wait, the Goblin game. Come on over, Lachlan. <laughs> so Lachlan's gonna show you how to play it. Use the arrows. Go ahead. There are two players. One player uses the arrow keys and the other uses W A S D. For player two, you use S to attack, and for player one, you use you use down to attack. So you have to knock out their lives, which is displayed on next to their goblin avatars. 
If you ever see them in school, they're probably playing this, and I can't. And uh, if you have to, but you use it as a verbal color. You can use a super one, which takes out more lives. All right. Lachlan, how did Luca make this? Luca isn't here right now, but what did you tell me he used in two characters? He used like a tutorial and he made it from his own, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, That one, like you need the keyboard for it. That's how intense it is. I did not show them how to do it. When it starts, it's just a white screen. So he put all of that together. He made the backdrop, he made the characters and did everything. Um, the other one is one that if you guys have your phones, you can scan the QR code to me. Um, this is the one that I taught them in class. Yes. So if you want to pop the balloon, if you scan it with your QR code on your phone, you just hold up your phone, you'll be able to play it. Um, so I taught them how to make this, and then we made QR codes in the class, and they brought it home to their parents so they could see it. Um, for those of you that are not watching, they basically, there was a balloon flying around, and they have to click on it to pop it. So that was a tutorial they followed with me, but they evolved. <laughs> Um, so then the next slide is the spheros that they do. Sorry, but I don't remember. <laughs> um, the spheros are another block based programming. It's an actual robot that they're coding. So they're using the same types of coding, but coding the robot to move. And we don't have mazes with us today because I didn't have time to bring tape. But my demonstrators are going to show you guys from the board. So if I want to have, have some volunteers, they're going to show you how to make it work. Yeah, they'll show you. Anybody else? I got three more. Okay. 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 Yeah. So the people that can't see what they're doing, so what they have to do is the same concept. They put the block face coding together, but they have to look at angles and decide what way they want that block to go. So when we did the main, they had to see how far they wanted to go, how fast they wanted to go to get us through the main. I guess I'm just going to name with everybody right now. I was like, what did you guys think? They said you're pretty hard. Um, so I'm trying to work on after 20 minutes. I'm sorry. I'm getting up to Right. So, like, so like what they would do is they would step, so if they knew it was this long, they'd say it was three steps. So how many seconds were the steps and then how much speed there is involved. I'm going to give you like two more minutes, but again, for anybody that is listening, a really good thing for this is that I can do a capital thing. So right now, they're writing a lot of these coding, but for ABC and for some of the 12 or 1 gig, I will let them draw, and it will take them to draw. So it still helps them to find like how the robot is talking about the one that they have to grow. And as an older grade, I don't know if I want to figure that out. You can grasp the way that they move so that they can analyze the data. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. So I gave the mazes. Everybody yeah. came in and was like, "Why are there dead bodies on the floor?" Like, yeah. uh, and then now and then I'll give them like during after the whole scene. I said, "You guys can just use it." And I had so many kids. They're like, "Well, can I be like? Yeah, yeah. Can I?" I had kids that were building holes around the room, and they had to they did not of course know how to get past things. So just letting them because yeah, learned the skills. Yeah, I see plenty of tools, and I wanted them to be able to. Build from that. Yeah. 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 Kavita and I planned it together where you'll get to see projects K through 12. These will be there. Coding will be there. Um, I know the art show is coming for the technology and art department. And it'll be just a really cool day. It's for the community. Anybody can come. Um, it's a day of different, I think there's about three or four sessions that you can come. You can do the projects that we're doing in class. The vendors will be there. And I think it'll be really cool. So thank you. Did you say where? Oh, it's at the high school. Sorry. It's here. Yes. Time. Here from 9 to 12 on 25th. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Um, thank you, Megan, and thank you, boys and girls, for coming out tonight, and thank you to your parents for getting you here to show all that off. I just want to give a quick plug. First, let me thank Meg for taking this position for us. We've been grooming her for a little while. Um, but I also want to thank her colleagues who aren't here tonight. So we're very proud and very excited to have this program, K through eight. So Heather Angelo runs the kindergarten and first grade STEM science program. Kathy Holtzman does it at two three. And Carissa Locatelli is our middle school person. So kudos to all of them. They clearly are doing amazing things for our kids. So thank you, everybody. Hey, fantastic. Okay, so we uh, have changed the agenda slightly to bring the superintendent's report um, front and center for a few reasons. Um, Mr. Hockwriter had requested a leave of absence, and in his absence, we have Dr. Loro stepping in as our acting superintendent. Um, I think it's really important that we give him a warm welcome. We're grateful that he's here to help us. Um, and I want to let him introduce himself to everybody. Uh, please give uh, Dr. Laura a warm welcome. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And it's been uh, an interesting two days already because the, yesterday was a snow day. So <laughs> I warned them when they called. I said, please give me the emergency closing list because in my last one, we had not only a snow day, we also had a, an honest, a real bomb threat and needed to close so twice in the course of a week. I said, I'm not walking into the district without that plan. <laughs> sure enough, we needed it. So hopefully that won't pass and we're not going to have any of those other things that I don't even want to mention again. But, um, but it's, it's good to be here and um, I'm spending my time just getting acclimated. And so this is my first board meeting, really the first time meeting the board as a whole. Um, and it's been in a good feeling about it and working with staff and uh, Right now, I haven't been able to get out of the district office, but I do plan on doing that and getting around to the schools. But for the this probably better part of this week is just trying to work on um, getting to know what the issues are and getting to look at how to address them. And I know that that's a concern and even a concern for some of you that are here. So one of the reasons for doing what we're doing is that maybe I can answer questions before you all start asking them. But um, I, you know, I know what the issues are. I've, I've spent time when I found that I was going to be doing this, um, not only looking at your wonderful website that has a lot of material if you haven't looked at it, um, the strategic plan, all that good work that was done with that and where it's at. Um, in addition to the board meetings, budget presentation in January and the rollout of the budget presentation to get a handle on it. You should know this, uh, as I've said to the board, I have a, a, a dual certification. I was a math teacher and computer science teacher, so I know about programming. Um, all that was very interesting today, and I appreciate the demonstration. Um, 
but my interest has always been in the area of math and numbers and all of that. So when I did my certification up at New Paltz, I did my certification in, in becoming the superintendent and getting my license, but I also did the school business official certification. So I, I actually have both. I've never been in Enrique's position, but I know enough, we talk the same language and it's really easy to work with someone that I that understands me and all the numbers, so it's really good. Um, I enjoy that part of it. I like putting budgets together. I enjoy the challenges that we face. The challenges, obviously, um, a number of them are, you know, taxes, tax rates and the like, and what's going on with Indian Point and closing and tax in, impact that that will have, uh, you know, on the district and in your future. Um, again, I don't have solutions tonight. I have a lot of questions. I'm still gathering information, but we have a timeline that we want to work with. And what you all should be aware of is that we probably will become, the board will become very active in the process and try to be making decisions in a, in a consistent way, getting to the budget vote that we have on the 12th, correct? It's, I did it again. 16. May 16th. Well, the budget vote, I'm sorry, the budget vote is May 16th and the adoption is April 12th. I'm, that's what I meant. Yeah. So our bigger problem is the April 12th deadline, which is coming up sooner. Um, and then we've got a month to go out and talk about it and explain what's in it. But getting it built by then in a short, I don't know why you just started from scratch, because obviously they've been working on this since January. Um, and we're working on it now together, along with the other administrators, to try to put together the pieces that make up the entire budget. Of course, the K-5 piece is what are we doing and what are we, how is that going to be implemented makes a huge difference. Even just to correct whatever we saw and I heard from all of you, the busing piece, the, the transition pieces, all of these, no matter which one we tweak and whatever change we make will cause an effect or have an effect on the budget. And so it's important for us to get that one out of the way early because it really sets the stage for so many of the other things that we do. I don't wanna leave our secondary people out of this you know, conversation and the board it, it has expressed some interest too in what are we doing as far as improvements. So yes, we're interested in maintaining a reasonable tax rate increase, but at the same token, we'd like to improve instruction in some way, shape or form. That now is, through K-12, not simply just the elementary side of this, the, this, the coin. Uh, and so we will look at all of these things and we will have an eye toward what improvements can we make and yet still maintain and control the budget so it doesn't get to be too much of a, uh, of a tax rate increase. Um, I think the, if I may go back to the Princeton plan, and, and I think we may as well say publicly that we want to tweak it. We're not looking to get rid of it because I know there were some people asking that question. And I say that because it's the best program that we can have at this point in time for a number of reasons. And you went off on the right track to try to do it. And that is the equity piece, equalizing program and making it more efficient. And I know that I think in the past year we're in given the information on it. And that's the kind of thing that I would like to bring out over the next several weeks and have your um, have you understand what's in the budget and what it will look like as we go forward. And the reason for those things are many, but more importantly is keep an eye always on the students, keep an eye on the program and what is it that we have that we want, what are the things that we have that can be improved and what are the things that we might have that Maybe it's time for a change. And I don't know what those are right now, but you know, as we go through the process with input, not only from, and I say the staff with a big S meaning everybody, and that is, you know, whether it be a teacher, a custodial workers, whatever the problem is, whatever it needs to be, make sure it gets fed through the proper channels and through the right resources so that we understand what it is that you need and wind up giving that contention in the budget process ultimately to the board and then adoption by the board. So that, that's where we're going. And I do understand what the concerns are. Um, again, as an educator, I'm concerned about the transitions. The first time I heard about the plan, the transitions bothered me. If you think about early childhood days, I mean, it's hard to remember them, but maybe you have your own children. Uh, it's enough to get them familiar with something. And you know, if it's a year or two in a building and then you yank them out and you're in another year or two in a building and then again, 
and then finally onto the middle school and on its on their way, and they're a little older. So the transitions are an issue. Um, we know that the present one, we've got busing situations where people are students are on the bus for longer than we want, 40 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever that might be. Um, and if we keep things the way they are, then obviously we need to improve the busing schedule anyway, or look at a new busing schedule to better fit our needs. So it, with all that being said, um, I mean, I can go on. I've been talking to a lot of groups and a lot of people in the last day or two, um, including our PTA people today. Uh, there's probably a lot more that I probably didn't think of. And if there's something else you can think of that I should say, I will, you know, really address it. But I look forward to really getting in there. I, I am in the building. I try to get in as early as I can with traffic and get here on time uh, and then work. I don't care if it's late. It's two nights. I've been here on two nights. It's been seven, eight, nine o'clock. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm here to do the job. I'm here to keep you get the things straightened out and move us forward and make sure that whatever we do by the time the next budget is being put in place for July 1, that it's what the community wants and what the issues were have been addressed. That's really it in a nutshell. And that's the best I can do for you. Well, thank you um, for your patience and we'll stand. Can I just ask one question? Yeah, just because I just I want to just make sure that everyone understands and we clarify here. When we talk about um, we're not going back to the way that it was, but we're not keeping necessarily what it is now. I think it's important for, for everyone to understand what that actually means. Um, can you explain that a little bit about what what that might look like? Sure, sure. I mean, we we're, we're toying with a K three structure at two of our buildings and a four five building as one possibility. Today we looked at the possibility of going K one two and with three four five but we're not sure that any one building would be able to handle the three grades. And now all the schools would be able to handle three grades. So that's the other one that we're looking at. Then we're looking at, as we look at that, what does the transportation mean? Well, let me just explain briefly what, because you, I think you can conceptualize it. If we, I'm gonna name them wrong again, but there's okay. BV at one Vernis and Vernis Woods is the two Perfect. extremes, right? So if we look at those two as our K2, K3 buildings, then the transportation is limited to just the smaller area. And right, then they'll become your community elementary school. Then it's not a bad thing to do around third and fourth grade where you bring them all together and you've got Furnace Woods that captures that very nicely. I'm sorry, it's the Thank other you. one. Thank you. And that one would then take the, those middle grades and then they would be able to go off to the middle school and onto the high school. So that's the two things that we're thinking about. Whether they fall out that way depends on the classroom's availability and or how the transportation breaks out. So what we don't want to do is increase costs. What we're looking to do is either come cost neutral or even, if possible, decrease costs. I'm sure that we're going to go a little bit over my promise because I heard about a few things today that we need to probably do that one building may have this and not have that. And so we'll have to kind of look at what it is that we have to do to make those improvements and what those costs will be. So that's where we're heading. Is it? I just want, I mean, I want everyone to also understand that this is not, this is just proposed that's stuff, right? We're not, nope. we haven't, there's no decisions that have been made. This You're hearing about it sort of the same time we're all hearing about it. Um, and I just wanted to clarify that for everyone, because I know that I saw everyone's faces and I see people nodding heads. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, what, everyone wants is what's best for our student, right? So it's up to us to evaluate that. Um, and it might not be best for everybody, but we're gonna try to make the best compromise possible. And um, that's where, that's how we are here sitting here now. Um, and it took Dr. Loro to come in and kind of give us a little direction, right? I mean, and so we will evaluate this um, just like we've been evaluating everything else. I, I just wanted to, because I know there are teachers, it's not only because the teachers are in the room, I would say this anyway, I don't mean to leave out my concerns about the teachers who already made the move last year and to go through a process again. So we are speaking about that and we will discuss um, ways to mitigate that or to improve upon if there's another move involved. 
how to make that happen as easily as possible. So that still, these are all moving parts and all of them need to be considered, in, including reassigning people to, to different buildings. Yeah, I did. Thank you. I, I did leave out the one thing that I did want to speak to. So on the um, Indian point in the decommissioning, I mean, I uh, Joe had served on that, so I will be on that committee and serve on that as well. Uh, but I know that there's a group concerned, and so am I, actually. I said, geez, well, I want to come in there as a radioactive, you know, it's a joke, but anyway, I, I know it's not. Um, to look at the thing carefully and to come up with, we've got money for monitoring and to try to create with community input a better system that would, uh, as I said to Benita, can it handle it? What I'd like to do is get monitoring devices within the community, particularly on our schools, so we can test water, air, and oh, sorry, yeah. water, yeah. air, and the ground, the ground. And so what those devices would be wired to our system so it would feed data say down to our offices here in the district, and then somebody is constantly looking at it, and we know whether the needle is moving one way or the other, so that we're aware of if there's a potential problem, what to do about it, rather than right now, we are not sure whether we, I mean, there are people here that don't believe what they're hearing, so it would be our own private monitoring system that we would put in place that has nothing to do with what's going on over there, and nothing to do with anybody from the state. It'll just be our system that we will get through our own RFP and a process and an implementation plan and people on our staff that will be looking at it after they're schooled about what to watch for. And then that will be reported out. We'll figure out some way of getting that information out you know, through to the district. It was up to me. I don't have a problem with it. You wanna look at it? Uh, maybe we can make it available so you can see the monitoring devices yourself on your own computer system. It's if it's possible, we'll do that. I, you know, I'm, uh, as I said, if I used that a hundred times today, I am very transparent. You have a question, the door's open, make an appointment, come on in. Carmen is the keeper of the, of the calendar because right now I, she just points me in a direction and I go. <laughs> I haven't had any lunch again today, but that's two days in a row. No, it's great. I wanted to lose weight. This is a good way to do it. So, um, it's fine. All I'm saying is my it's been pretty full. So we've been talking about how to you know control the calendar a little bit. But please, if you have a comment, my email, you know what it is. It's Dennis at Laurel at Hendrick Hudson Schools. And Hudson School. Sorry, and Hudson School. Yes. So feel free to send a note. I like to look at them tonight. I gotta make a promise that I should probably look at them before I go to bed because I don't like them accumulating. And all day I haven't had a chance to look at them. So I'll probably go home because I'll obsess if I don't go to sleep with knowing that I answered everybody's emails. So <laughs> I have this thing about emails. So. But thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. So while we're in superintendent's report, we have to kind of hit all the all the bullets here. Um, Margaret, did you want to give a pre-K update? Ready? Okay. So the RFP process closed on Friday. We have two collaborators interested in working with us, a new collaborator and the collaborator we have had. I visited the new site this morning. Looks lovely. Uh, we talked about programs. She showed me around the facility. I actually was there while kids were there. She shared with me some information that I could share with parents because obviously, when the application goes out, I ask them to rank their choices in the lottery, and then we figure out where people are going. Um, I continue to get calls every day, so I'm just waiting for all of you to give me the green light to put the application up. I will email the parents whose emails we have in the system. Those are siblings of current students, so we're aware of a certain number of incoming four-year-olds because they live in our uh, student management system. I'm sure that there are other students out there that we're not yet aware of, and they would then be able to go to the website and get the application. So I want to develop that timeline for people. I just spoke to a lovely woman this morning, and I said, call me back tomorrow. <laughs> so you need to be able to tell me what direction we are going in with all of this. How many seats do they have available? The second, the first collaborator could take 18. The second collaborator would be interested in 10. The second collaborator collaborating 
with any other school already already um i so this the first collaborator is rising star we collaborated with them this year they're on the croton border the second collaborator is aunt bessie's in peekskill um they do work with peekskill schools i'm not sure if they take lakeland um so they already have the pk students that are yes they do they have children of all the preschool ages so they have three-year-olds four-year-olds they have what we used to call almost kindergarten, the kids who miss the cutoff, okay, and are there for an extra year. So, uh, so are we saying we're only going to take twenty eight altogether, or are we talking about having our own classes? That's in the end? question. If you want, more. right? Well, well, what is it going to cost to have additional seats? Additional seats, yes, we'll, uh, our own seats. So yes. we're we're gonna have the two classes again. I think it was somewhere in there. No, I just want you to explain that that ten thousand that uh -huh. we'll probably target. Is so we continue. It's a competitive grant, but right. go ahead. We continue to get information on the expansion grant, and they still owe me information mm -hmm. on Title One spending. The way the expansion grant will work, and as Dr. Loro said, it is competitive. So you know we're in the mix with however many districts through their hat in the ring as well. You must first meet your already granted seats. So Kendrick Hudson has 73 possible seats at $5,400 per student. The additional monies don't kick in until the 74th student. So well, we can get there. You can, we we so, could get there, but it would mean, again, if we had more collaborators, that would have added to the mix. Uh, we will have 30, if, if we go back out again, we will have 36 students in the two programs, the two classrooms that we currently have. It's up to this board to determine if you wanted to add to the district program. But how many did we have signing up uh, for children last year? That, so I don't think it was that many. that's an well. Let's talk about why that might be if you're a parent. So I think last year we had 68 families in the um, lottery. There were parents who were a little put off about the lack of before and after school opportunity. It, the only place they could go for that was Rising Star. Uh, there were parents who were hamstrung by the lack of transportation. So there were parents who some of us are lucky enough to have a workplace where there is daycare. Um, a couple of parents did express that to me. Some parents traveled and so took the child to daycare with them and then brought the kid back home. So we know that not all of the parents who were possible four-year-old <coughs> participants even put their name in for the lottery. Again, I don't know, but I know, I think, I think Harmon the we're, not, we're not changing any of that formula, right? We're not providing transportation. We're it just it sounds like for those parents that situation is not going to change. We're not providing the only, after school or before school. That's tweakable because that's that's within our control. I would say the bus thing is not. There is we just did a, a survey of literally everybody. I mean, we went, I don't know who asked. For us to do this and we're happy to do it so we literally polled all of the school districts in westchester rockland putnam some of duchess and some of ulster basically the folks who are part of the consortium at boces right now and we're pretty far reaching at this point which is fascinating and a good thing um there is one district that buses their preschool kids so we'll share that with you. Jane's putting the finishing touches on it. What we asked them was, do you participate in UPK? If you do, do you keep it in-house? Do you farm it out? Are you a hybrid like we were? And then some people said, this is, we're going out now. Uh, one did, Yorktown actually said to me, can you send your RFP? So I think that they're probably considering it. Um, there were people who said they could do it, but only outside and no one was willing to collaborate with them. So it was a very interesting conversation. So, Sorry. No, I just, you know, I'm all for UPK, but I, I just don't feel like I have 
my arms around what the cost is going to be. So I don't want to figures. That's what we're not going to remember what they were. Yeah. I don't want to lie. On the top yeah, of my yeah, that's all we, we had two questions on that, and you were going to come back with some different numbers, right? I think right question. Uh, it's it's two, it was 200 and something thousand out of our general fund. Yeah. 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 That sounds about right. Based on the internal 36. For the two, 36, seat, for the two programs, the two classrooms cut down. Right, which is a, a little less than what we, we paid this past year, or about the same? Same. No, yeah, same thing. Same. Same. Right. Okay. My question is so you hit 74 in a perfect world. Yes. You get additional money. Mm -hmm. How much mm -hmm. additional? It's ten thousand dollars a seat instead of fifty four hundred. So an additional forty six. Oh, that covers the entire cost. What are the? I don't know that it would no, cover the no, entire cost. It gives you ten thousand dollars per oh. additional seat, not oh. ten thousand dollars for the existing seat. So you would still have to oh. pay. You would only get fifty four hundred up to seventy seats, and then you would get ten grand for each seat. Oh. Okay. And that is the way that Dr. Laura and I were talking earlier. That is the way they rolled out. The round of funding that we received two years ago. So there were always districts, as you well know, around us who had pre K. In years past, the funding, we were allowed to do a half day program. So the districts that ran the half day program with the old money, the minute they touched the new money, the new money could only be full day. They could grandfather their half day, but they couldn't use any of the new money on the old, so the old program. So some places have half day with the old money that they continue to receive. And then they open full day in order to be able to take new money and give new children opportunities. Okay. So this is the same principle. You're gonna keep the old. If you get there, we'll give you the new, but you can't mix the funds. Okay. okay. Yeah. Is there, um, would there be any collaborators interested using our space there are people who do that they lease space out for a dollar mm -hmm. and they bring people in mm -hmm. that you know maybe that's something that we discuss do you have to use that list of qualified or can it be any they have to meet the requirements of the new york state program but which it... is again why many people don't jump into that fray. but it could be an opportunity for us, like for just say Rising Star to grow their program within our building. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right, because then they're not, they it's not a site house. expense, right? It's just a teacher expense for them. But, and it would open up opportunity for people that don't have the appropriate facilities, but may have the staffing to be able to utilize space that's already qualified for public education, but wouldn't qualify if you were to use their own facility, which would reduce some of the expense. Maybe two districts that did that. I well, can't remember. Well, do, we, do we have the time to come to that kind of do that research and put out like where we you need an answer now oh, next week? Well, if they so that seems like a lot of research project, we don't have time to do it right now. So if they didn't respond to the RFP, it could be any number of things, including certified staff. So remember, they're using their own staff right. person. Um, if we said we have a classroom, we'll go back to Jen's example. I could call them tomorrow and say, you know, are you interested in renting space for a dollar? We'll give you a classroom and you just send us your teacher and your TA and we get 18 more seats. The so she uh, it doesn't work out good because nicer outreach was not allowed. Well, I, we do know districts that do that. So districts do it. Should, yeah. So I think before we maybe let Margaret take the brain and take a yeah. look and see. Yeah. And fall back I, up and then do a Janice for the side. Okay. I have one other question. Okay. Sorry. Because renting it when we went to four seats, I mean, it was a regular middle school class. Because um, four seats is also a nicer condition. If you don't increase the rent, but you can see the way everything happens as a customer. This is how to do it. So I have might be less of a cost. Well, go first, yeah. Look, well, Margaret, you're you're asking like, what do we? So you need us to make a decision. What I feel like I need as a trustee to make a decision is I need to see that budget again, and then 
that what's the per pupil expense? So divide whatever the budget is by our 36 students. And do we have any other academic or otherwise programming where we spend that much on a per, on a per pupil basis? Because that would help me compare. Like I see UVK is making an investment in our youngest learners. Um, do we spend that that much money per people anywhere else in the district already? It would be helpful for me as a trustee to make a decision. Okay. Well, so the easiest one is me. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. 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 I knew the answer to that one. Oh, so I would well, like to see that data. But that would that would be helpful for me to make a decision. General general ed, general ed or special ed. But yeah, but, but if, we have special ed programs through the district. We have ELTW at the high school. You know, we can certainly look and see what does it cost. And how many students are enrolled, and then say to you, "Here's X amount. What's our per pupil spending anyway?" Just in general. Yes, that would be helpful for me in this interview. Thank you. I have one too. Go okay, so I just there's one other thing I'd like to to know. Now I'm very comfortable with the job that we do internally for the 36 spots we would have here, but when you're outsourcing to other third parties. I'd like to get a sense of how we ensure the quality of those third parties. So I know they have to meet certain standards, but do we visit them on a regular basis? Do we get parent input? Like what is the oversight that we have? Because ultimately we're responsible for the quality of those kids' education and their care. So just getting comfort around that would help me. So the collaborators are entitled to choose their own curriculum as long as it meets the New York State pre-K standards. The collaborator we used this year did that. They have certified staff. I visit them once a month and I try to pick different times to visit. So I see different aspects of their program. We just surveyed all of our parents, including our pre-K parents. So, you know, we are on top of that. We, and I said this this morning to the proprietor at uh, Aunt Bessie's, we treat all of our pre-K students as though they are Hendrick Hudson students. So we did the initial screening. We will do the end of year screening. We screened for ENL. Um, I can't think of anything else. You know, we compared report cards to make sure we were looking at monitoring similar things. The drawback, and I said this this morning as well, one of the things I heard pretty consistently from the parents who were at the collaborator this year was that they felt isolated from the program. And part of the problem with that is that and, and we can't fix this, is that we don't transport. So like we couldn't say, you know, come every Friday and spend the day because all of those parents have to drive their kids to us and then bring, and not everybody can do that because a lot of people that went there went there because they work and they had before and after the day. So that's a problem. And it will be, you know, it's a, not a problem that's easy to fix. I do know that Cindy, Dr. Kramer, and uh, Mrs. Emanuel and Dr. Lefebvre, did a pretty good job of sending out ahead of time invitations so that parents could plan. We're having Valentine's Day party and they let them know that like weeks ahead of time. Um, they did something I believe with class photos. Um, they did a number of things to try to get folks to come and do something with them. But that, and I get it, I really do. Um, but I will explore the, the rental because there are at least two districts that I'm aware of. And I think Lisa knows another district that does do that. And I'll let you guys know what that looks like. So I, I think, Jeremy, you have a question. Do any districts in Westchester, I, I don't know that I know the answer, so I'm asking it, it's not a, does anyone else in Westchester County support a in-house UPK program through their general fund? Like Austin has in-house UPK, but it's 100% paid for by the state. They're not limited to the $5,400 a seat or whatever, because it was existed before. What districts, if any, pay for UPK and outside of the general fund? I would say that with the exception of districts like Skill, Austin, uh, perhaps Mount Vernon, who get a lot of different grant money, Yonkers, um, every district does because $5,400 per student is never going to cover you. But program. every district doesn't have in-house UPK. Okay. Croton doesn't offer it in-house, so they don't they, support it. Yeah, individual. Lakeland does it in-house. I'm sure that they do. Uh, I'll have to top my head. I can send that right. out. OCs has, can we ask OCs? Because isn't there a form where you submit whether you support your in-house UPK through the general fund? I don't know, but we asked who has it, and I can pretty much tell you that if they have it, 
it is not no I, I don't think anybody is adding to the pot I think there was one district that added to the fifty four hundred dollars everybody else it just passes it through if the, if you want to collaborate with us no no I'm not asking for collaboration no asking, so internally again if you look at what it's costing us so who has it in house though that's my question I, right I can't remember off the top okay. of my head I know Lakeland only because I have children there if we could find that out I think yeah. it would also sure, be helpful be because I want to know if everybody has it and we don't, we're behind the curve. If nobody has it and we do, and it's a lottery, it's it could be an, a, an attractive piece or it could not be because people don't care if it's only a lottery, they're not going to move somewhere and then not get it either. Right. I'd like yep. to get a little bit better bearing on what it looks like and how it helps us compete as a, a, a destination district um, to sure. our peers. Well, I think, it's, I, I think it's fair to say that by next week, we will make a decision on this topic. Um, you know what we need, Dr. Lerner's next meeting. Yeah, the next meeting on the eighth. Um, hopefully we have all the work that we need in place um so that we can make decisions and keep this moving on. One thing, Margaret, is when you bring back names of districts that have it don't have it, can you tell us half they full day? Oh yeah. Okay. And they, I, they've actually said it themselves. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> We have the budget update under superintendent's report. Sorry, I think we have to do that here. Thank you everybody for your patience. Typically we try to do our audience comments right away, but we wanted to make sure that um, Dr. Laura about to speak before we got started. And then I realized we had all these items under superintendent's report. So thank you for your patience. All right, Enrique is going to do a budget update real quick. Good evening, everyone. Um, we budget update because we have time to since the first since our first meeting. So um, let's start with uh, the good news. Uh, the good news is that uh, uh, the state paid um, increase two hundred and twenty two thousand dollars from the legislative legislator to the governor's budget. The address originally they told us that it was going to be between uh, 9.5 and 10.29. Uh, we got it at 10.29, or it came out at 976. That's another decrease of 250 dollars. Then um, we got three teachers in elementary school in Nigeria. We don't teachers. Um, Get replaced, then we're going to save two hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars. If they get replaced, we can get that. Um, and So we're going to be saving forty two thousand dollars. Then back in January, before I uh, we presented a budget that would be between eighty eight point one and eighty eight point five million. Uh, today our budget is expected to be around eighty eight to eighty eight four. Um, last year the budget was eighty six point six. So that's um, in January, we were expecting the budget to be uh, an increase of between 1.7 and 2.2 um, in March. Now we are expected to be an increase of between 1.6 and 2%. The preliminary tax levy is still, it's still like in mo a moving target. Um, back in January, we thought it was going to be between 2.3 and 3 percent. Now it's got between 1.6 and 2.4. But um, after some discussions with uh, Dennis, um, that can come down a little bit more. So um, stay tuned because the good news might, of might still happen in the next couple uh, of weeks. So uh, then is uh, your salary will be paid by not by the okay. not by <laughs> not by the community. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. So finally, 
preliminary budget, um, our state aid increased about 53% and that for two reasons. Reason number one is because all, all the districts in the state of New York are getting back foundation aid that was taken back in 2010, 2011. And number two, because our wealth ratio decreased because of the closure of India Point. Uh, both is aid, as everyone knows, is based on how much money we spend with policies and we're increasing that on a yearly basis. Other income represents um, we shop for special ed, interest income. Interest income um, is going up substantially. Today we invested $7 million for three months at 4.5%. Last year, it would have been at about a quarter of a percent. So uh, we're doing we're doing well there. Our pilots, I'm taking into account that um, hopefully we pay us at least the same amount as last year. We're expecting more, a lot more, but we need to be a little bit conservative. And the cessation fund is the second year. And as you remember, every year it increases 10%. So the cessation fund would be $1 million over to 14. That gives us a, um, no property tax revenues of 47.2 million. With a proposed budget of 38 million, something with that credit will be about 50.7, which is an increase of 1.6%. Um, the tax gap, our tax gap will decrease 20%. So um, last year, because of the pilots, it went up substantially to $61 million. Today, it's only $49 million. Um, so if we have to go to contingent budget, we would have to cut $792,000. I just like to put that in the presentation. I know. We it won't happen. And, um, it has never happened in my while since I've been here. Um, so that's it. Um, I thank you again to our high school and middle school art students. Yeah. Um, any questions, please? So go back to budget update slide if you could. So three teachers in elementary school retire. So I just want to make sure it's clear. So current grade banding model. If we didn't change, this would be a savings of $556,000. And any changes would be a possible reduction to that savings? No, exactly. Uh, I, I still haven't gotten the number of teachers in elementary school. Margaret will present next week. So that's why I like to do it like that. If if we need to replace them because we need teachers, then you have the number. If we don't, then you have the other number. So I didn't want to say one number or the other one until we have the final count of elementary school teachers. If we don't have to replace them, to replace them, it's about 577,000. If um, we have to replace it and replace them. It will be only two hundred and seventy-seven. So just saving We'll have an answer next week. Yeah. Yes. All of the decisions we're making are affecting all of this, so we're just giving you a, a range right now. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. All right. Again, thank you guys for waiting patiently. Uh, now we are at our audience comments for non-agenda items. Carmen is going to call each speaker up uh, by name. I'm sure many of you have heard this before, but we allot 15 minutes for public comments. Each speaker is limited to three minutes each. We ask that you step up to the podium and share your name um, with the board. 
please be respectful. Please know that we can't address anybody in the room or, or district personnel um, and, and keep the three minutes so that we can keep the, mo the meeting moving along. Um, Carmen, who do we have uh, first? Our first speaker is Dan Flamenco. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me out here. Um, good to be with you, Dr. Laura Pankrad, I guess I have to address, but sorry for that. Um, so uh, I'm here to speak about Indian Point. Um, I guess, first I'll say that uh, if you're able to bring the community together on a principal plan solution, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be the first to nominate. Um, but even if you get that done, um, I'm still gonna have more expectations for you on the safety. Um, of our community. I do appreciate really your comments on having independent monitoring that is not subject to the state or anybody else and is for us to rely on. And part of the reason I want to deliver that is because I have a bit of a depressing message and it's that I really feel we're on our own for protecting our safety. Um, and it's really up to us as, you know, a local community to be able to do it. Um, if you look across the board, you know, the politicians want to redevelop the site. That's a, you know, conflict of interest. Um, the regulators are very close to those they regulate. Um, notoriously uh, the case with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, so, you know, again, it's very hard to rely on external parties that are, you know, not happy rustling feathers or otherwise. Um, so we do want to be self-reliant. Um, and there's some really good recent examples of why we need to be self-reliant when we're thinking about the safety and particularly given the proximity of our schools to this demolition process and some broader community uh, concern. But, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, the natural gas pipeline had a giant sinkhole under it. Um, and, you know, there's not much explanation of why that happened or why it couldn't happen right next to our schools. Um, you know, it's sort of up to us to be overseeing them and asking the right questions. We need to ask the all questions of these companies. Um, you know, I was at one of the recent decommissioning oversight board uh, meetings, which I will now be a member of. Um, and I talked to the new Reg regulatory commission representative one-to-one -one after the meeting, and he told me he'd be comfortable drinking tritiated water. Um, in a direct conversation. I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it. It was a few months ago. Um, that's not the person I trust to look out for the safety of the kids. He doesn't live in this community. Um, so we really need to look out for ourselves. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, just a couple of weeks ago was reported in, you know, the local papers in Cape Cod about the Pilgrim facility that they found cesium-137 on the roof in sediment. And so Holtec says it was from the nuclear fallout from testing or from Chernobyl. I wonder, Nuclear Regulatory Commission actually questions that based on reporting the article. Um, the last thing I want is for two years from now to find out that something happened today uh, that we didn't know about for two years. That's the nightmare scenario for this community. And I think we're sort of on our own to be asking the right questions, be very skeptical of everything people are telling us and look out for ourselves. So um, again, welcome, it's a big thank challenge. You. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Victoria Riel. Hello. I'm here to speak about the Princeton Plan. Some proponents of the Princeton Plan claim that it promotes diversity. However, after reviewing demographics, it would appear that 66% of classes had zero ENL children in them. Over 50% of the fourth and fifth grade classes have no exposure to ENL students at all. A minority of classes have ENL children, and where they do, there is a heavy concentration without the requisite resources to ensure a proper learning environment for both the ENL and non ENL children. One proponent of this plan has expressed relief to have more diversity for her child now. However, ironically, the school her child attends is now less diverse, less diverse than before. That particular school went from 9% African American to 7% after the Princeton plan was implemented. In terms of the purple. In terms of the preparation for this plan, it was thoughtless as can be. Nothing has been done to the infrastructure to accommodate it. New York State has specific requirements for kindergarten bathrooms that are no longer being met since migration to this plan. Most kindergarten classrooms are not retrofitted with bathrooms, nor are hallway bathrooms with toilets of requisite heights. As a result, a considerable amount of learning time is lost as children go back and forth to bathrooms outside of their classrooms using the buddy system, and using toilets that are designed for older kids. This inefficiency is not only against New York State planning standards, it has resulted in lost learning time for our children and educators. 
Furthermore, this inefficiency is causing major complications, such as our youngest learners getting locked in stalls and requiring teachers to leave the classroom to rescue them. This inefficiency also leaves our youngest children more vulnerable. Proper lockdown practices in the event of an intruder cannot be followed with our youngest children regularly in and out of classrooms while roaming the halls. School shootings have become more prevalent of the late, and this is a major concern of mine and should be to any parent. We should have armed security at our schools. Thank you for your time. Michelle Verma. Welcome to Henhut Thank you. Three generations of my family are Henhut grads. Two generations of us still live here. I would like for all of us to continue living here. I'm here tonight to talk to you about Indian Point. And the reason for that is because I want to convey to you the urgency of the issue that we're facing right now, and also the gravity. And to urge you to rely on the resident experts in our community, specifically Dr. Williams, who have been knee deep in this issue since it began, for depth of knowledge and understanding, both as a resident, as a parent, and as a scientist, is something that we could not afford to buy. And I hope that you would rely on that <clears throat> because she is an incredible resource for us. One of the issues that we're facing is that Holtec as a company is untested. They have not decommissioned other plants before. They got the license to do this because they partnered with another company. That other company has left. So now Holtec is on their own. But if you research them, you'll see that there are documented incident incidences of safety concerns and allegations of bribery and unethical practices. I was relieved to hear you mention air monitoring. However, it's a little bit late. Holtec announced last week that they had already completed packaging spent fuel. So any monitoring done now is wonderful, but we're already late to the game. And that's why I'm here to convey the urgency to you. You're only here for a short time, but unfortunately we need you to do a lot for us in that short time. <clears throat> On March 9th, 2020, which if you recall is a couple days before the world shut down, the Office of the Inspector General of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission released a report on the pipeline approval process. In that report, they questioned every single safety assessment that was conducted on that pipeline. In fact, they even said that one of the tests that they that was documented in that report was, quote, reverse engineered in order to achieve a specific outcome. The safety concerns here are tremendous. This is a community that has felt like it hasn't had a voice in the shutdown of the plant, in the de decommissioning of the plant, and in the power of our representatives to do anything for us, we need oversight and we need a voice, and we are begging for it to be here. Thank you. Good evening, board, and uh, good evening, Dr. Well, thank you for joining us. So, I gotta be honest, uh, you probably told us more in the last 20 minutes than a lot of us here have probably gotten in the last two years, so I appreciate that. Um, so, I'm gonna read what I wrote. So, um, as you already know, the district has been on the turmoil since the implementation of the Princeton plan. So, your arrival in a bipartisan approach has been something many residents have been longing for from our leaders' children. The implementation of the Princeton plan was not created from a neutral mindset, but from a mindset of someone trying to force a square peg into a round hole. The community wasn't able to give creative feedback, nor were our suggestions taken into account before the implementation was forced upon us. When the Princeton plan was being talked about as a cost saving initiative, many residents had questioned how it would actually save money when it was being laid out. The district also hired a consultant firm to do a study, and the consultant firm agreed that this particular model was the least desirable model for the district and would bring the most hindrance to the community. They cited concerns such as general logistic issues, increased transitions for students, complicated logistics for transportation and parent pickups, increased travel time for parents with multiple children, <coughs> larger class sizes across the board for all three schools, and teachers not being able to communicate with each other about particular students because they'll specifically be moving from building to building. The report also stated that the status quo option 
would be favored over all explored options in the report, although they did note that it would, it would be zero net cost savings. But they also stated the great centering model or Princeton plan options would bring significant change to the neighborhood school concept, which has been embraced by residents in the district from their research. What we have come to learn is that this plan that we have selected has not been saving district money as was promised from the previous superintendent, and more than likely may end up actually costing us more if things are not changed. On two, one, the district had a forum where many parents spoke about spoke out about their displeasures of the Princeton plan, and at that point asked the board to start working towards gathering facts and finding a way to revert course for the following school year. Since then, the school's leadership has found every way possible to prolong the truth from getting out to the residents, which I believe with proper research, that the proper research was not completed prior to the rush implementation, resulting in a major failure financially and logistically. I know that you have your hands full walking into all of this, but take the emotion out of it and just focus on the facts. To continue down the road, knowing that the plan is currently not doing what it was intended to do, according to the old superintendent, which uh, which was a cost savings initiative, and in his own words, has no impact on student achievement, is not designed to help educational deficiencies or improve student test scores, and does not create equality amongst the schools. I, I don't know why we continue down that road. Um, but please look for the facts to yourself and thank you and you know, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, board. Thank you again for the time. I did write something down, but after Dr. Laurel's speech, I feel like found it necessary to uh, read. I'll just say a few things. First, Dr. Laurel, thank you for being here. Thank you for accepting the position. Your wisdom and experience and leadership is truly needed right now. Um, I am someone, like a lot of us, who are opposed to the Princeton plan. Not a fan of it when it was implemented. Don't think it's right for this community. Uh, my son is someone who left me on the bus for 30 or 40 minutes each day in the morning. And, and that's troubling to me. Uh, I saw a bus on Watch Hill broke down this morning. Now, what if he was on that bus? That is probably 15, 20 minutes at least. Uh, that to me is unacceptable when there's an elementary school down the street. If what the district is trying to accomplish is, is equity, true equity, that's fine. And I'm, I'm all in, I'll, I'll back that 100% and, and help come up with ideas. But what happened a few years ago with the previous board took advantage of a situation. It's Indian Point closing. Now, this isn't new, the Princeton Plan to our district. It's been voted on before, it's been shot down for, for good reasons. But they took advantage of the Indian Point closing when we had a big hole in the budget and if we have to do something now. Doing nothing was not an option. But what we should have done is taken a little bit more time, gone through the different options, and really come up with a plan that make this district better. One that could potentially save costs and improve equity, improve the education. Look, it's a reality. Cost is going to go up in this district. Okay, we're not going to raise it. Nobody's naive enough to think that at some point this isn't going to impact us financially. But when it does impact us financially, it should be for the good reasons. Okay, if it is necessary building improvements, if it's improving the curriculum or certain programs that we need for kids. Not to fix problems like we're doing now, like fixing the transportation issue, which is a problem that we created. Okay, if we just chase our tail and create problems and then fix them, we're not actually accomplishing anything for our students. All right. So I said what I had to say. I'll give one minute. Uh, I'll just both say quickly what Dan said and what Michelle said. There are two resources. Miss Courtney Williams. Those are people you should be listening to um, uh, when it comes to the Indian Point Youth Commission. So please, please hear what they say. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Next speaker is Christina Dundee. No, we've um, approached our 15 minutes. I'd like to make a motion to extend our public comment period. All in favor? Pardon, how many speakers do we have total? <laughs> Christina, you can come on up. <laughs> 12. 12 total. <laughs> The adoption of Princeton plan is not the single most issue or issue facing the community or the district. The implementation and the views of the pros and cons of the district's new policy <clears throat> are just distracting us from the safety issues that could plague our district for years to 
expensive plan was supposed to solve finance, financial impacts after Indian Point was placed offline. It did not. As recent information and forecasting has shown, the diametric opposite is true and the plan is a financial disaster. As stated by administrators, Princeton plan has no academic benefit. It does not bridge any gaps and it does nothing to address the safety of our students and children. If we're treating our children as lab experiments, what are the key outcomes and performance indicators being captured by the district? How are we measuring the plan success and unearthing opportunities to improve the district's operations? Has anyone from either side of the argument seen any of these? Rather than dividing us, perhaps we should focus on something that can unify us all, the safety of our kids. There are ongoing active forum discussions within the community surrounding health and safety effects of decommissioning on developing children, where experts in the medical field unanimously determine the best course of action is to close the school. Both proponents and opponents of Princeton Plan have united in believing BV should be shut down. Why? At the Pilgrim Plant in Plymouth, Massachusetts, workers were exposed to radiation due to a mistake by Holtec. It took more than three years for that information to be released to the public. Is anyone here comfortable with this? So we would not learn about a mistake that happens today until 2026, and by then it would be too late to do anything. Holtec now controls a decommissioning fund north of $2.5 billion. Do you think this school district or community stands a chance against that type of war chest in court? Holtec stated in the last DOB meeting that they could dump 1 million gallons of tritium laced water into the Hudson at a moment's notice. They are under no legal obligation to let anyone know. They agreed to tell Riverkeeper one month prior, but that is not at all binding. The new bill in the legislature lacks any teeth, $25,000 fine a day for dumping water. It would take Holtec one day to do it, so why not just pay the $25,000 as a cost of doing business? That is one one thousandth of one percent of their decommissioning fund, and now the problem is solved. The window for bargaining has passed. Our only real recourse is to close the school to children during decommissioning, which will in turn allow the surrounding community better access to services on the single road, one-way evacuation route in the event of an emergency. The school district needs to close this school and divide the students between Furnace Woods and Frank G. Lindsay, and with the savings of the closure, invest in the other schools in an interim plan that ensures access to quality education for every student. With what we have learned, it makes more sense for the district to open up the admin building and move the admin activities and offices to BP. Let the adults who have more choice work in that building near the decommissioning nuclear power plant run by a company with a track record of safety violations instead of the children of the district who do not have a choice and who must attend BB equally. As long as it's equitable and until immediate plan is implemented, our children will receive equal exposure to radiological releases and not find out until it's too late. Do something now, our children matter. Hello. <laughs> oh, welcome. Thank Glad you. to have you. You walked into a buzzsaw. <laughs> <laughs> Something tells me you're going to handle this. Uh, look, I have prepared remarks. I thought about this for a while. You know, everybody who went already stole my thunder and heard all about, you know, this, that, and the other thing. So I'm going to say simple question facts. That's all that matters here is facts. It's a math problem. That's what this is. It's a math problem. It's not about anything more than a math problem. It was sold to the district as savings. It's not, it's not even close. The numbers have been run. Okay? It's not. It's a math problem. This is just, uh, and the question I have is why can't we go back to what we had already and then figure it out? This was so poorly thought out and voted on in the cover of night under COVID and all that stuff. Why can't we just go these remarks of garbage? Why can't we just go back to where we were? Okay? And start over. It's a do-over. Sometimes you play golf, it's a mulligan. Why don't we do that instead of sitting here and trying to figure out, oh, we'll do, you know, compromise. There shouldn't be a compromise because there's no savings. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, and when I said earlier, dealing fact. I know for sure, not maybe, I know for sure there are people who are getting up here, and, and doctor, you said this earlier, you know, is this DEI, which is wonderful, because me, honestly, as a short guy, I know people judge me. I, I've been in business for 30 years. It's not, it's not my first rodeo. I know that, but it was never sold as DEI. It was sold as savings. So if we roll it back and go back to where we were and think about it, and then Rejigger it and maybe roll it out again. Maybe that works, but right now this ain't working. So, you know, and I know there's people that are going to come up here and they're going to tell the soft story of, oh, I heard someone say this and somebody said that hurt someone's feelings. 
I've had my feelings hurt. I get it. Okay, I've been called everything in the book. Um, it's not about that. It's about the community. It's about the children. Put them first. That's who matters most. We have an obligation as a parent to fight like hell for our kids, to make sure my daughter isn't crying, getting on a, almost said a bad word, getting on a bus because she doesn't want to take a 37 minute bus ride. That's not cool. That's not the way this should work. This should work where the kids come first and the money comes second. That's what this is about. So I appreciate y'all listening to me. I said y'all. I appreciate everybody listening to me. You know, thank you. This board is fantastic. You guys and gals have, and folks have really turned the tide here. And I appreciate it because we weren't listened to. And to frankly said earlier, doctor, we learned more in your tenure than we learned in two years. Thank you so much. This past Friday, I met with a homeowner interested in selling. They moved here in 2020 and have four kids. They were shocked to find out about Princeton plan after moving here, which would not work logistically for their family. You see, they thought they were purchasing a house a couple of minutes from the elementary school their child would attend. And their story is not unique. 30 children were pulled out of the district this year for similar reasons, and many more, maybe even my own, will be pulled out next if things do not turn around. The Princeton plan we have discovered is not saving money, is unideal academically, is not equitable, and is a transportation nightmare, and has also torn the district apart. Almost all proponents of Princeton plan center their argument around the same crux, one underperforming school, but instead of fixing the issues at hand, they rely on Princeton plan to band-aid them by shifting around principles and grades. It's asinine to think that that is a solution. At best, it is masking the issue, and at worst, it is spreading the problem to other areas of the district. Some proponents of grade banding have given their argument the patina of equity. To quote one Facebook parent, BV has a heavy load of ENL students. With Princeton plan, the resources can be restructured so the burden is not on one school and affecting the non ENL students unequitably. This sentiment reflects not only what they really mean by equity, but the failure of this district to provide adequate resources. Dispersing ENL children from one school and moving them throughout the district will not solve this problem, but rather exacerbate it for these children while creating a slower pace of learning for others. Princeton plan has cost the district substantially in terms of transportation costs, and that is money better invested in educational resources and tools to help both ENL and non-ENL children that have been left behind by the fiscal irresponsibility of this district. Furthermore, have there been any consideration of what ENL families have endured this year? I've noticed that those in support of uniting families at the border are quite sanguine about tearing them apart with this plan. Just so there's no amb ambiguity, I do not believe in compromise or middle ground. The data is out there and it's clear this plan should never have been adopted. I will not compromise with people whose arguments are not rooted in data and facts. We do not placate people who are ill-informed or have ulterior motives. My children would love nothing more than to eat candy bars for breakfast every day. Should I compromise with them on that front? It's the board's responsibility to do that which is right for the district, not which is popular. I will conclude by saying, once and for all, that those without children directly affected by this plan are weighing in without personal consequence to themselves or their family. Their only stake is financial as taxpayers. And it's clear that this plan is costly, so I'm not sure what dog they have in this fight. And I find their motives questionable. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen Irwin. Uh, welcome, Dr. Dr. Laura. Thank you for stepping into the role of superintendent at this critical time for our community. I would like to bring to the attention of the board and administration again the current risk present at BV Elementary School. Our school's cafeteria is 400 feet from a 42 inch gas pipeline, the largest size in use. In other states, pipelines carrying volatile materials are not zoned to be within 1,000 feet. 
of schools and other hard to evacuate facilities such as nursing homes and hospitals. Uh, this June, our district has scheduled reconstruction of this school's cafeteria to begin. Community members such as myself are asking to halt this planned construction as this activity, along with the planned demolition of the reactor towers of Indian Point, 4,000 feet away from our school, can impact soil stability around the pipeline, specifically soil near shorelines, inland waterways. A 30 feet deep, 10 feet wide sinkhole developed along this pipeline at Worktown Heights. It was, December, it was discovered December 24th, 2022 by a resident walking their dog, not a pipeline inspector. These construction and demo activities increase the risk of a pipeline rupture, rupture and sinkholes near our school, specifically the playground and cafeteria. Our nuclear power plant is the only facility in the country that was allowed to have multiple gas pipelines beneath it. This co-risk is amplified by the pipeline's age and noted failures along it, as well as its 400-foot proximity to our school. The cafeteria is the current shelter-in-place location for the school. If it is unavailable due to remodeling, many of us feel the library is an inadequate alternative. There are windows to the outside, there are windows to the hallway, and these windows in place are not blast-resistant. A realistic evacuation plan does not exist for the co-risk um, of the pipeline rupture during demolition of a nuclear power plant at BV Elementary. I advocate for the closure of BV Elementary to protect the surrounding residents that live nearest to the site. Removing the 500 children plus staff attending the school allows first responders to care for nearby residents directly if there would be an emergency. There is one road in and there are no sidewalks near the school. OSHA and PESH exist for the safety of employees, but there's a vacuum when it comes to the health and safety protection of children. I publicly ask that you defer your seat on the decommissioning oversight board to someone experienced with these issues. With the division in the community over the implementation of grade banding and the many problems to solve there, there's simply not enough time for you to advocate for our safety through that board. Local environmental justice advocate Dr. Courtney Williams is extremely knowledgeable of the risks inherent to the Indian Point Energy Center's decommissioning and has been a leader and educator on the subject for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shannon Silva. I'm going to keep this really short and sweet. Um, I signed up tonight and I have two questions, and one of which you already answered. Thank you for clarifying that we're not going back to K5. Totally appreciate that. Still would love to know where we're going to be in six months. But I totally get that. And then, like, we just little like teachers deserve that. The kids deserve that. Like, where are we going to be? Um, my second question is there is a video going around. I don't have time to fact check. I don't want to say it's propaganda, it's being declared as facts. If somebody from the school could just go through those numbers and get back to the public and say, hey, this is true, these are, these numbers are right, I think that it would put a lot of things that they, I mean, there's people hitting, literally hitting the pavement and throwing flyers in people's mailboxes. So if that information is not correct, I think the school has a responsibility to tell the community. Thank you. Let's be careful and shut the door Yes, This is sort of impromptu, but so please take okay. it. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I had a letter that I was contemplating reading, but it's really everything that I've said so many times, just how I'm a big fan of the Princeton plan, because I think there's a lot of social, emotional, and educational opportunities within it. I hadn't signed up to, to say anything, but a lot of the comments made me realize I needed to. First, let me address, you know, many, we're looking to reorganize our district for generations to come. This isn't a discussion for only elementary school parents. Would you readjust the plan annually because there are new families in the mix? No. This is something that impacts everyone. 
And families that don't have children in elementary school, such as myself, have actually experienced the bias because it is there. There is true bias. There is a bias, you know, associated with one school over not the others. There's an us versus them attitude that actually exists in the school. And this is not the first time it's been addressed. I know we keep talking about finances, but it's been addressed for many years, not because of finances. It's been addressed because there is an inequity in our system and there's a bias in our system. It's an ugly undercurrent that no one wants to speak up about. Not true. It is there. It needs to change. I have seen it firsthand. I've been the recipient of it. People, friends of mine have. So to say it's not true because you're concerned about long bus rides, if you change it and do two schools that are K to three, the kids that are going to have to move to deal with enrollment issues and to make sure that you have equitable class sizes are the ones that are in BB. They're going to be the ones that travel to Furnace Woods. It's not going to be the other way around if you do two K to three. So these are things that do need to be addressed. And, you know, and financially, a lot of people talk about finances. A lot of the savings this year were actually reinvested in PK a bigger STEM program, smaller class sizes without needing to hire additional teachers. Those are real actual costs. So those things all need to be considered. And if you want to actually look at what it, uh, it costs us, you should do an itemized list of what it actually costs us. Because I think you're going to find there are a lot of efficiencies from the Princeton plan model that will just continue and will offer us the opportunity to have educational opportunities for all the children, not just one school over another. So as a mom of four, none in elementary school, thank you for listening. Thank you, everybody. Now we are to our consent agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Second, all in favor? Okay, we're going to get to our program budget presentation on transportation presented by Ms. Liz Gilio. Give everybody a minute, please. The Laurel, members of the board, I'm going to go through my uh, budget and My continuing initiatives that we have is uh, to improve route efficiency and to better serve the students. Uh, this plan has been an ongoing initiative since the grade banding plan was first approved. We know that there's improvements we have to make. Um, we've already, I've already met with Dr. Luro, and you know, Kathy and I have our work cut out for us. But um, better to us do it because no one knows the district better than we do. Okay. Um, we're going to con we continue to work with athletics to reduce overtime um, and spending for sports, and we continue to util utilize shared services. Um, we've partnered with other districts uh, that have children that attend out of district schools, and we you know sh uh, do some ride share with them. Okay, uh, some of our enhancements we have in the safety for this uh, on the bus this year. You know we continue to utilize a web based. Um, program for our transportation building and ground personnel with the same um, program, GCN program that the teachers also use and everyone else in the district. Uh, this year in February, uh, when we did our New York State Required Refresher, we also had our representatives from Alice Harris come in and we did a number of tabletop exercises with the drivers as far as, you know, when you pull up to a school and the light is flashing on the outside of the building, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? You know, what decisions are you going to make? You pull up in front of the school and the kids are pouring out of the building and what are you going to do? You know, load those kids on the bus, get out of here, where are you going with them? Okay, we want to make sure that our drivers feel comfortable and are empowered to make those decisions on their own without having to, you know, ask for permission to do things. 
A, we received delivery on 272 passenger type D buses. Um, finally, we got them in January. We ordered them in uh, right after the budget was passed in May. So it took quite a while. There's a lot of uh, backlog in uh, the receipt of vehicles. Uh, we completed installation of the new lifts at the bus garage, and that was something that was in our van two budgets ago. Uh, we finally you know, got all the equipment we needed to get that installed, and finally we're done. It actually, the project is finished. Um, we did originally want to put two lifts in, but because of increased cost, we were able to only put one lift in. So, um, you know, that was a big hit for us. We really wanted to get that second side completed, but right now we're able to work with what we have and um, we're able to get the jobs done. Okay, we also installed external stop arm cameras. Uh, we joined a, as a pilot program with Bus Patrol, and I know you guys have seen me, you know, on TV, and apparently I was on TV in Rockland County this morning. Um, and we did that to collect data for Westchester County so that they can see that this is a problem in this community. It's a problem in Westchester. It's a problem in New York State. In New York State, 50,000 buses are passed a day. 50,000 school bus passes a day, right? So um, we're trying to get Westchester on board and we're still pushing. Um, I know that a number of the superintendents, um, including Mr. Hockreiter, had sent a letter to uh, Mr. Latimer's office. We're still pushing. Okay, so we're still trying to get through with that. Okay, we can go through my line by line items. So my uh, list of transportation, non-instructional salaries, that's an increase of 140,910, uh, and that re represents um, four halves of employee. So Anthony and I share buildings and grounds, and I share uh, our employees. So half the expenses in Anthony's budget, and half the expenses in my budget. So that's where that 149,10 comes from, and that's a 9.1% increase. My non-instructional chauffeurs line, that's an increase of uh, 5547. That's a 1% increase. And that, that covers their raise uh, based on the CSEA contract. Uh, my chauffeurs in the handicap uh, line also, that's an increase of $6,867, also a 1% increase. Non-instructional overtime, that's uh, $1,788, also 1%. Field trips, we increased a little bit because of the, uh, the grade banding model and you know more field trips going on. Um, you know, we increased that uh, by twelve hundred dollars, so that's a four point six percent increase. And our sports, uh, we increased by two thousand dollars, and nearly to cover the uh, the increase in the uh, CSEA contract. Okay, my equipment line stays the same. My contractual expenditures is increased by five thousand dollars. I'm seeing increases in my rental for our uh, two way radios on the buses. Uh, and also some of our other little things that we have uh, contractual contracts with. Right, that's a 3.2% increase. Materials and supplies, that's the line that I pay for all the parts to repair the buses. And that increased by $9,500. I find myself having to continue to uh, move running into that budget line. So I increased it by that $9,500 in the hopes that I don't have to do a number of budget transfers in order to um, meet the needs of the repairs. So that's a 10% increase there. Uh, gas and diesel, right now we're, we're paying about $2.59 a gallon still for diesel. And our gas prices are uh, about $2.47, I think. I just looked at the bill today because I was just doing fuel billing. Um, so without factoring in the new buses that I'm asking to purchase and you know changing around some of the Princeton plan, we're looking at an increase of uh, $8,989, and that's a 3.2% increase. Lubrication and oil, that's a $500 increase. That's only seen a slight uh, raise in pricing. Tires and chains, um, that's an additional $5,500, which is 18.6%. Our insurance. Um, so NYSER is telling us that we're gonna, we should look for about 11 or 12% increase, so that's why you're seeing those numbers there. So it's increasing by $5,368, which is an 11% increase. And then our umbrella excess um, liability is another 3,032, so that's a 12% increase. Okay, bus garage equipment, 
Um, it's a three thousand dollar increase. We had to have to purchase a new uh, system that reads the computers on the buses. Everything is now computerized, including our buses. So, like you know, when you go with your car and you go to the dealer, you know, plug it in. We do the same thing with the buses, and it gives us a reading as to uh, where we're having issues. Um, so that's a twelve percent increase in that line. Our garage contractual stays the same. Uh, utility, our oil is the same. Water stays the same. Electricity is a big increase. Um, I didn't have enough money in my budget to really cover the use electricity use at the bus garage, so we had to increase. I buy that. That and Anthony did say that that's he's seeing a big increase there, so that's why that's a twenty percent increase. Okay, our property and general liability insurance. It's a two hundred ninety one dollar increase, so that well, two is twelve percent. And then materials and supplies at the garage is $273. And we use that line to purchase some of the office equipment that's in the garage, but also for purchasing, um, you know, some of the harnesses and safety seats and that, the, uh, that our special ed children use. Okay, so my numbers on the bottom are a little skewed and I apologize for that. Uh, the second column for 23, 24, it should be 4046826. Apparently, I transposed my numbers and I apologize. The increase is 198.659. So it's a 5.1% increase. So those were right, but I transposed my numbers and I apologize for that. I'm requesting for a vehicle proposition uh, to purchase two Type B diesel powered buses as per the established vehicle replacement plan. I'm asking for Type B because there's a delay. Uh, in the reception of our Type D, which is usually what we, what we purchase most often, which is the transit style buses. Um, if we were to try to purchase those, we wouldn't get delivery until January of 2025. So that would do us no good. Can you, um, can you quickly just, because I don't know sure. what the difference is. So the Type B is the conventional, which is the engine in the front, and the Type D is the transit style, the, flat, the pusher, mm -hmm. and the engines in the rear. Um, it's also a, a difference in cost. So this bus is about $30,000 less than the other bicycles. Um, so if we did, if we, uh, based on a 3.5% interest rate on the van, uh, it would be a yearly cost of 52717 And then we, really, it's over seven years. The van is five years, but we um, carry it out to seven years because we use the buses that long. Okay. Um, so my last part of my budget is the grade banding, the potential additional costs. Um, if we stay in the current model, then we would need seven monitors uh, to add to the K-1 buses. Uh, we've got an agreement with CSEA to use monitors for three months. Um, I based it on the CSEA um, hourly rate for the chauffeurs which is 27, uh, 31 an hour. Um, we're looking though to use TAMA members to do this. And I know that uh, Mr. Hockrider had met with, uh, with TAMA and had this discussion. I don't know how far that is, nor do I know who's interested in that. So, um, so that's where this number, this 26,763. So it's seven monitors times two hours times 70 days, which would be the first three months of school. Okay, um, we would also need to purchase two additional buses. So that too would be the cost of 161, 331 per vehicle. Um, the ban would be for the 332, 664. We would assume an interest rate of 3.5%. And so it would cost us 52,717 per year over you know five years, and then we would extend out to the seven years. Additional fuel, based on our current fuel costs, it would be an additional ten thousand three hundred thirty nine dollars for fuel for those buses. And we're assuming, based on what our current routes are, and you know that we would drive an additional fourteen thousand four hundred miles. So that's where we came up with that 10,000. Okay. And then the additional vehicle cost would be for maintenance and repairs and tires. And the 91 cents represents um, 
you know, the mechanics uh, hourly rate and everything is all factored into that. And that's where that 91 cents came from times the 1,404, 14,400 miles comes to 13,104 for a total of 100,002,923 per year. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, so two questions, one one for you, Liz, and one for you. So the first is just to understand. So 102,000 per year. Would this get this down to where the students would not be on the bus for more than a half hour? Would this fix our transportation problem? Hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. I can't say that until I go through all the rounds. You're the expert. Well, right. you're, you're saying grand banding potential additional costs. Right, because right? we're right, assuming cause I'm looking that if we stay in the current model, current model, current model, that I would have to add buses to each school. Right. So and correct. that's what this is for, correct? Correct. You wouldn't need more buses than this than you're asking for here in the additional gray banding. Well, I'm, I'm asking for the two in the gray banding. I'm asking for two for the replacement. Correct. But we need the two for the replacement anyway. Correct. Right? So it's just an additional two. Correct. So Enrique, to you, the question is 102,000 per year is two tenths of 1% tax level. Is that correct? To fix our transportation issue. This is, hey. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put Liz in a position where she's saying it's fixed. This is to make improvements. She has to go present right. the worst this case is, scenario. This is, That's what we said in guidance. But what well, it doesn't even this. say that it would decrease bus times or solve any one thing. This was the fix. This was the fix. But what's the definition of fix to get it back to where it was? To reduce the bus. That's what I heard in front of me. That's what I heard to get she it back to where it was. I can't promise you that kids are going to be on a bus for 17 minutes like they were last year. I can't promise you that. <laughs> Would it be 20? <laughs> I don't know until I and I have to pull apart every single route and reroute every single child. But that's what that's what we need in this slide, right? We need in this slide what is it going to take to get transportation to where we need to be in the current bus in the current model. I think that what this is right. going to do is it's going to get transportation back to a more palatable place. That's that's what I'm I'm asking. So that's is, that's is it, what it's gonna do. So does it does it fix if we're talking about two tenths of one percent in tax levy? Um, is right twenty percent, hundred to five hundred thousand dollars is one percent in tax levy. This is one fifth of that, so it's twenty percent of one percent, two tenths of one percent in tax levy. Right. Okay. I don't think to we, fix transportation. We didn't, we didn't tell her go to town and make it the 17 minutes that it was and make it equal. We said, how do you help? How do you help the problem? I, 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 I don't want to speak for it. It's palatable. So what would it be to get it to so what, what I have, When I talked with finance and what I have spoken to uh, Dr. Laurel about was that it's important for me because I, didn't, I had a hard time understanding what was given to me to do. All right, for this school year. So we had a, they had a consultant come in. We, you know, the district hired a consultant. The routes were made. So for me, looking at the routes, it didn't make sense as to why children are going on a tour of the district to get home every day. Right. So Which my feel, right. my feeling is that we would regionalize the routes. So I have children at a BB school that need to go out to Thomas Woods. So we would ex, we would. Put them on buses to express yeah. them rather than going through, you know, a number of the communities to get to there. Yeah. So right. that's that's my that's what my plan is. So Kathy and I had my secretary and I had a long conversation about it today, and that is absolutely what honestly we're starting tomorrow. So so if that's the case, right? I would love to know how much more it would be than one hundred and two thousand dollars per year to get to where we where we want to be in transportation. And then I would love to balance that against what the cost would be to move to a different model. Uh, right? But because also be to one percent. Yeah, but look at the monitors. The seven monitors are only for seven days. That's not for the school year. Well, that's what I was about to say. I'm actually a little disappointed in this because I think parents want to see that we are looking at monitors on buses for more than 70 days um, and that we have them available to us in case there's a problem. So I think we need to take that into consideration. 
And I think another thing that parents have really, you know, discussed with us about their, the issues that they're having are the times they're waiting at bus stops, the fact that they're the gang bus stops where they're, they're walking further to bus stops, and the crossing of double yellow lines has come up as well. We didn't address any of that. So I, I want to know what it's going to cost to fix that. Yeah. Okay. Right? That's what I'm, I'm so disappointed if we this double happen. this, if we double this and it's $200,000 per year, we're still talking about four tenths of 1% in tax levy to fix this. Right? The it's, it's not just the transportation. This is just the transportation issue, right? But what, what are the other big issues? Well, the transition. The, so the well, transition, like, I you can't fix that with a bus. I mean, bus you yeah. can't fix that let, with a bus. Let, let, let me explain something mm -hmm. that probably is not here. I will put it here because Anthony needs it for Shell. We have it. In order for you to work here, to be a custodian tribe. Yeah. Besides the custodians, everyone has to be talking. If you remember last week, until we said, I need to be. If we go back to where we were, if we stay the way we are, I need two people because they, 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 they used to be two more people. Or if we stay the way we are, because instead of having a custodian at nine in the morning to say, now it's coming up and put because it's driving longer hours. So here we didn't pack those two other half people because no matter what, no so, matter what we would need them. Yeah, I, so, so. Well, it's just it's creating more complexity. Yeah. Right? I just want to know what is it going to cost to fix yes. trans well, I think, transportation? Okay, okay. Well, I, I, I think we do need that, but I just want to call attention to you. This is a manual process. It will take Liz so much time and work to run all of this. So if this is truly an ask of the board, we need to have a majority that wants that information because she is going to spend hours, and correct me if I'm wrong. It's not hours, it's weeks. Weeks running these numbers so if the board is in agreement that they want to stay in a, to the two years and keep them in the same buildings and you want to know how to bandage this up and make it look better then we we ask for that but we can't ask for that and waste Liz's time if we're changing direction but that's true that, that that's fair but how are we going to know if it's worth changing direction? Changing no, 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 direction no, no, no. if you don't know what the cost of fixing no, 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 what we have. I want to, I don't want to, I don't know if you have this answer, but do we, do we know the number of miles our buses travel in the old model yes. and the number yes. of miles travel in the new model? And I also remember that this is yeah. in addition to what we have today. Yes. Right. Uh, so, that's so, what I'm saying. That, so this, this again, Enrique, this is not, it's not a fair representation then because I'm thinking I see $100,000 extra per year to fix transportation. That's, that's not the whole grand scheme of things. But, right? But or, you're telling me there's a lot more hidden embedded costs that's not. No, no, here. no. What no. it says here is great funding, if we stay in the great funding, this is potential additional costs. To today. I get that. No, no, but if we go back to one of our presentations that we said yeah. we're going to be driving 80,000 miles more, uh, $4 or whatever after a mile and everything, then this is in addition. So whatever that number was there. I completely understand it. I, I just I just want to make sure that we have all the right no. data to make a good decision. Of course. And if we don't have that data, we can't say the model that we're proposing here makes sense because we can't go back to the community and say, well, we made a mistake. We, we, we got, the mistake we made last time, is we didn't do enough due diligence. We didn't get enough success metrics. We didn't get enough data. 
I'm asking for the data. I'm asking for the success. I'm, 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 I'm asking for all the things that we didn't get last time. And I want to make sure that we're doing all our due diligence before we make another big decision that's going to disrupt the community for another long period. Uh, uh, okay. okay, we made a mistake and we're not making the same mistake. I totally agree. Okay. However, this is a budget, you know, this is just a budget presentation. If that's what you want, definitely for the next week or for whenever the board says, we'll bring you the comparison as close as possible yeah. of what would be Princeton plan against neighborhood schools based on what the match written last year and this year. That's the best that we can do, but Which that's great. But so that's what I think yeah. you want. That's exactly so. Like, and I just defer. Transportation. It's not just transportation, right. correct? So, but, All the costs and success metrics. And this is where I defer to Dr. Laurel oh, no, with no. his expertise to say, how do we compare where we are today to where we need to be tomorrow and what makes the most sense based on that from a cost perspective, I, from a student education perspective, from an SEL perspective, from a DEI perspective? There are lots of positives and negatives to all the different. The slides you shared with me two weeks ago, I think, would be really helpful for the rest of the, mm -hmm. the board to see. Uh, I think it would be really helpful for the community. We saw, we heard from the, the comments from the community tonight that people want to see these numbers. So I think if you could present that um, in a way for all of us to, because sure. you you walked me through it, and I had, uh, it was really helpful for me. So I think the whole entire community and all of the students would really that. I, I totally agree. I'm not defending, but you are completely right. I'm just saying today was a budget presentation based, given that no one knows because you don't know, the doesn't know, no one knows what kind of plan we're going to be next year. So if we just have to go through, we are assuming that if we stay, this will be the extra cost. That's all this is. I totally agree for you to make a different decision, which is should we go to neighborhood, have neighborhood, whatever. You need a lot more than this. Yes. Yeah. I, I, that's what I'm saying. But, but, but to Corey's original point, this is not what we really needed to begin with, right? Because the goal here was with our, to whatever budget we were going to put forward next year, if we're in this current model, was to try to fix some of the problems that we've heard from parents over and over and over again. This doesn't address any of them. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm not going to tell you to go back to the drawing board, but I, I do think we we have. Do you have any idea? Because we asked for this and we never really got it, and it's not your fault. We never got like what the average bus time is, what the median bus time is, how many children are on a bus more than 35 minutes. Because the goal ultimately of this, what was promised to the community, was that kids wouldn't really be on the bus longer. In 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. That was our initial goal, right? We didn't get there. And I think parents, that's that's that was the solve, right? I mean, that's the fix. That's the goal. Yeah, we that's want the we, buses to be on time. We want the kids to right. be on a short ride. We want to have monitors on the bus because we didn't anticipate there would be problems without the diverse ages of kids. Yeah, we also just want kids standing and sitting on the floors. This doesn't right. address that. Well, yeah. it also doesn't address, think so, so bus times can't be the only measure either. Kids having enough seats, and this was just one. It's just this one. was to address kids having one enough seats both in middle school and, yeah. and elementary yeah. school. So that's not true. And um, we did talk about gang buses, but you did say you'd have to get back to us. Or gang bus stops. Okay, that's what I wanted And hear. the double lines, you did take, take an action to go look at that. So I mean, I don't think that it doesn't not address them. I think she needs to build a detailed schedule. Well, because I'm putting my budget together, I wasn't putting together a, rent, a bus route. Presentation, you know, like, I mean, I understand. You know, it's a different, a whole different subject. And I, I think that, you know, that wasn't something that I was supposed to include in here. But, you know, this is a conversation that I, that we've had, and I know. And, you know, kids crossing WL lines, and, you know, I, I know all that. I have six kids in this district, six grandkids in this district. I know all that. I know. All right. And I hear them. I hear the parents. I didn't create these bus routes. I, yeah, we have that. We have, I totally okay. understand. And when they were given to me and I expressed my concern about them, I was told not to change them. When I added a bus to Frenchie and added a bus to BD, 
the, I, you know, heard that that was, I shouldn't have done that without permission. So, you know, I was hired to do transportation. That's what, that's what I was hired by the, the board to do. And so, you know, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, and I, before you, I just want to, I also just want to, I, I know that we have the CSD contract here mm -hmm. and they agreed to this, which is wonderful, but I think we do need to make sure that we have other monitors like on standby, right? For that's part of the budget in case there's a, an issue, right? Didn't we discuss that earlier in the year? CSDA only agreed to three months. So, okay. No, no, no. You, you have a valid point. Right. We can add. Uh, we can try to find substitute chauffeurs for next year, and we can do it for the whole year. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't think we need 20 of them, right? But, but the, my idea, our idea here was for us to have a discussion, are you comfortable with this extra cost? Oh, yeah. Or... I was actually thinking we're doing more. Because I, I was going to say that. Or... Maybe you want even more, given that it's only a hundred and two thousand, and you were expecting. That's what, yeah. That's what I'm saying. And so, the idea here was to have this discussion for the board to tell us, hey, I want seven monitors for 180 days, and whatever that number is, put it in the budget. Right. Okay. That's what I'm saying. It, 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 maybe. Then is we can discuss with the board and have that specific presentation that I made to Alexandra and to Alexis about the cost okay. comparison separate to the budget so we can make a decision. Yeah, because we haven't not, we haven't seen that. Like I, so I haven't seen that. So everybody. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. We'll do it. I think yes. next, week, we next week we are we can do it next week. It's already done. Next week we have two major presentations, yes. but we can do it. You know, music and art. If you want us to make decisions, we need to start. Okay. Let's do it next week. Oh, how many bus? How many bus runs are there for elementary? Well, for the how many bus? BB Frenchy run. How many are there in the morning and how many are there in the afternoon and how many are there for Furnace Woods in the morning and the afternoon? Uh, Furnace Woods is seven in the morning and seven in the afternoon. And then Frenchy BB combined, I use uh, 12 buses to get them into school in the morning because they're combined. And then going home, I have uh, seven at Frenchy Lindsay and there's seven at uh, BB. So, how do we get seven monitors for two hours? That doesn't. Oh, that's K one. Oh, you're only going to do yeah. K one. So, mm -hmm. okay. Since we're doing, Margaret, you're doing your budget the next meeting, right? Yes. It just it would be helpful because Margaret's budget could change too if we go a different route. Yeah. So for her to give one and then another, like this is just budget season and this is what we're doing. I think for me and for the community so I can make a decision, we have this model is this bottom cost and these are the pros and the cons. This model is this bottom cost and here are the pros and the cons. But to do it at each one of these, mm -hmm. it, it's just way too confusing. I know that's, that's true, but I, so that's true. I agree, but what, Corey's original ask was, and what my original, my ask is, we cannot have, we cannot fixing any problem at only $100,000 with the current plan that we we asked them to do doesn't fix any of our problems, right? So or this, validate if it does fix. Right. right. So mm -hmm. like, I understand it's just a budget presentation, but on the surface level, this doesn't solve the monitor issue for families. We I think we need monitors, not just on K-1 buses. Like, when did we discuss that? Like we, this is not to me. This I I hear you that this is but if this was what the we're staying in Princeton plan next year. This is the presentation we're getting. This is not enough to fix for me to fix the issues we have. I think that's what I'm. So I know that's a, that's a big statement to make, but it and I'm not on finance, 
Um, but this does not address our, our concern. I think the biggest problem, the biggest problems in transportation were mm -hmm. the way that the routes were developed. And I think that that changing the way that the routes were developed, I think will make significant improvements. Okay. And we, and we can do that with existing buses or with the additional buses. Too. So going it, it, seven really, it depends on what plan you take. It depends on what plan you take. Okay, and I would love, you know, if the board is up to that, I would love to see that. I don't want you working weeks on this. <laughs> I know, I know it's going to take time, but you know, we need. I don't think we have weeks. No, we don't get. No, we don't. So, and let me ask the question: This I'm new. We don't have an automated bus. We use Transfinder, but you someone don't. has to sit there. But the, the data. I understand that. But that is not in there already. Every student's geocoded. Isn't it in there though? But I still have to develop the routes because right now, as the routes exist, so now we have to take the database, move it over, and then start to okay. go through the each student. We have to go student by student. So let me ask: Can you have that for next week? No. Not well, if I want a secretary. Well, what do you? Well, what would you take? Door. What <laughs> what help can we provide to get it done? I, we can't. We don't have the time to answer. It has a larger. Impact. On I understand that, but there's no way it'll be done in a week. Well, well, I will come back. And UK. I, well, I think what you need is parameters. So let me. I heard two things. Let me ask this of the board. I heard one somebody saying 17 minutes, and then I heard 34 minutes, and I know there were 60 minute bus ones. People, literally. what are we satisfied? With? What are we aiming at? What's a, a when, so what when, do you want? Never not to exceed them. Just to just so when this was when Princeton plan was proposed and when it was voted on by the board, the it was 35 minutes was what they were told. Okay. That the maximum was 35 minutes. Okay. And I think and that's where the major disappointment came in September. So the solve is 35 mm -hmm. minutes and no more. That's where we land. That's what we recorded. It's got to be more than just bus time no because i mean do you want a kindergartner picked up at at 802 and dropped off at 404 i mean that's a fairly long day for a five-year-old yeah well, that's he good. may be on a bus for 35 that's minutes but if he's out of his house for eight hours a day or she's out of his house i think it's a long time for a five-year-old yeah but that's not that but what we were but where, where he's but i think what dr Lord is what was what we were what was our goal originally right what, what was our life well, before what was our yeah what was our longest ride before Princeton was? 26 minutes. I think that's that. 30 I mean, minutes is a long 35 time for a minutes long, but that was when we so when it was presented. That's what it was. Oh, that's so we'll 26. Well, doing 26, 26, see what it looks like. We can go to 35 and we can do the problem. But I don't know if we're going to save a bus or two. But I, I think we need to solve the problem. Yeah. And if it's 26, then it's 26. We should just ensure whatever the longest bus ride was that we like the old previous. Just make sure before we say it was twenty six, because we've heard longer than twenty six here. We've heard other parents say they've had thirty five minute before, so we just want to make sure that we're on par. People said it. I have a non and, and more. Like, okay. we, don't, we don't want people standing around uh, getting the bus as they're expected. Yeah. So I have a non-fixed plan question. Um, <laughs> so your costs are increasing for materials and supplies uh, for tires and canes. Is that because of the cost of goods or the cost of goods? Okay, so that's just inflation that's going up. It went up last year, it's gone up again. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay. And then explain the four new half people plus AFA's half people. What are they doing and why do we need four new people on the staff? So a number of years ago, when I, I don't even know who the uh, superintendent was, we lost a number of positions, the number of custodial driver positions um, as people because we went through a you know big budget crisis and you know, so we lost a number of positions. We never gained those positions back. And you know, Anthony just feels very strongly that he needs to have these people in the building. And he needs all four this yeah. year. Okay. Thank so you. Okay. Two, 2 a.m. and well, 2 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, that's how. I think that was his Yeah. Point. That was, it's just a big jump because all. Yeah. And then I never heard that you needed another bus, another lift. That was, when you so said this, that we, was the first so, time. So two years, two year, two budgets ago, not yeah. this one, but two before that, yeah. we put in uh, for a band to do lifts at the bus garage because our lifts had failed inspection and 
So we were going through a whole big thing. And so we did um, go to the band and the plan was to put two and it was a half million dollar band and that's what we were gonna do with those. But when they finally, after COVID came back with everything, um, the price for the first lift was so high because the cost of everything had gone up so much that we didn't have enough money left over to do the second lift. So we've since um, done some repairs to that lift. The, it's passed inspection. It's able to be used. We can use it. You know, eventually in a real, in a great world, we would love to replace the second uh, lift. But right now, you know, I'm not plan. I didn't plan for that to be done. Okay. I, I just want to. You're below the 500, well below it now. And if it's only 75,000, yeah, it's not 100,000. No, the one we put in uh, was supposed to be uh, 300,000. I think it cost us closer to 400,000. Okay. And we, we put, need it after. And we put half an inch there. So. Enrique, is that, is that subject to state aid? Because now that our state aid has increased, would that mean the cost would go down? and? I would love to get Liz that lift if there's oh, any way we could do that. This next year, our transportation pay goes from 12% to 32%. There you go. So that 400,000 would be. That's great. Can we put it in the, the you know the, the building conditions plan and just add it to that? Usually, it's not usually everything that oh. has to do with process. We do it in a separate position. And so you know that this, uh, for some reason, but I don't know why, the 60 years that I've been here, the post proposition comes with more votes than anything else. Well, yeah, that's what people want for. I don't know why. It's just interesting that people might say no yeah, to the budget or yes, we get new bosses. I'm just giving you a point. Well, what? Yeah. And what's the depreciation for a normal lift? It's got to be more than no, 10 years, right? Oh, look, we have 20 something years old. So you've got that too, right? You've got the depreciation expense over time, you got the additional state aid. It sounds like fiscally we can. Right? Let's discuss it because again, the one thing it really will depend on the rest of the budget. The rest of the budget. <laughs> I was going to okay. say if, if yeah. we can bring down the tax level to a manageable number below two percent, I think that we be as well the six. I, I definitely do. Great. Thank you. So just one of the other things that we discussed in finance that we did discuss here is electric buses. <laughs> um, Enrique and I actually have a meeting with a representative um, from Bird Bus and a grant writer. Um, you know, I just came back from my conference in, up in Albany and everybody up there, all the experts are all saying that it's, it's going to be pushed past 2025. And, um, you know, there's like this magic fund of, you know, $500 million out there for, you know, people, but um, we'll see, we haven't qualified for a, for, you know, a grant before, but, um, you know, Bird Bus has a company and a person that they hired just to do grant writing. So we're going to meet with them on the 21st of March and we'll see where that takes us. Does the fact that we produce solar help us in any way? Because yeah. um, <laughs> just asking. No. But we also then will have to look eventually at the infrastructure of the garage. Because that's yeah, electric is yeah. We we're going to have to you know put charging stations inside because having them outside is not conducive to good charges, and so it's a whole big long list of things we'll have to do eventually. Is the is but the is the bus garage part of our APC the semen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I wasn't sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have anybody signed up for audience comments on agenda items? Yeah. Okay. Hi, and welcome, Dr. Laurel. I wasn't planning on talking, but I just wanted to clarify a transportation issue. Um, one which I have mentioned to you before, which was a bus thing. 
um, 26 minutes was not the longest time before. And I know that because my son, who is now in third grade at BV, was in kindergarten at BV, and before his bus ride was about 40 minutes. Um, he was getting home anywhere between 350 and 355 in the previous model. Currently now I have two children um, who are within the school. I do have four in total, but two who are in the schools right now. Um, and one is at BV, one is at FDL, and their bus rides have been shorter. In fact, one student comes home at 331 from FGL, and the other one gets home at 335. So I am not waiting um, for a long amount of time for two children now, where before I was, my son, like you were saying, that, that time out of the house, it was 20 minutes longer before that. I used to have to rush to get him to baseball practice at four, where now he can, you know, come home, have a snack before going to practice or a game. Um, and then while I'm up here, I have a few questions that I wanted to ask to the board. Um, if you are considering a new model, um, what would be the district lines? Who would, de who would determine that? Who would develop that? What happens when numbers change within district lines? Are we going to keep changing that every year? Um, and does that outweigh the current transition time that we have now? And then what happens to our students who are together this year only to be torn apart again next year? And now they're going to be in different schools and we're going to have that same issue of how are we going to get them together? Um, and what, what's going to happen to our teachers? Who's going to decide which teachers move when they have to pack up and are we going to be fair to everyone there? So I just have some questions for you to consider. I know this is all new. Um, so I'm just giving you guys something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, moving on to is there a committee report? I think. Okay. John, you better get this. Uh, and uh, my question I have is why or has the district looked at leasing some of this rolling stock? In other words, you know, in, in a lot of areas in the transportation industry these days, would be trucking, especially aircraft. People lease the equipment, you know. Yet the school district here buys all this stuff. They got all this heavy hardware sitting, and leasing would give me a much different perspective as far as having these buses around. Now I don't know when the last time anybody looked at leasing some of this equipment versus buying it. I know that you know you keep saying well the state reimburses us every time we buy a bus, but they don't reimburse you. I understand. Um, a couple number of years ago, a few of us looked at uh, liquid natural gas changing the buses, okay, uh, or compressed natural gas. Has anyone looked at that lately? Because liquid natural gas, compression natural gas, is a lot cheaper than diesel, and it's certainly a lot more abundant, okay, especially in today's uh you know trying to get away from fossil fuels and i know liquid gas is a fossil fuel but it's a lot more abundant and it's a lot more cheaper the time we looked at this the gas companies were willing to actually put in a refueling farm for you without a cost to the district again you know a way to cut down some of this extravagant cost of transportation which is always so high uh, or when was the last time we looked at actually farming the transportation out? In other words, you know, why does it have to be done in house if you can start saving some money by farming it out? Why not? I mean, it won't be the first district there. In fact, there are plenty of districts around here that have farmed it out. You know, when was all that looked at? I mean, you know, can it save you? I don't know what it can save you. Certainly, maybe it won't save you a million dollars, but who knows what it's going to save you? And with, with an $88 million budget, you know, anytime you save anything, you're doing something. And um, the last thing I have to say is doesn't anybody think that $284,000 in overtime is a little high for, you know, drivers? I mean, that's a bunch of chunk of money, folks. And, you know, here we go. I mean, transportation is going to be just expensive. Right? But, you know, you can knock it down. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, we had a, a safety committee uh, about 10 days ago right before the break. Um, we discussed uh, training staff in Narcan, and there was an update that nine staff outside of our um, nurse, nurses have been trained in uh, Narcan, and they've got uh, Narcan on their um, in the schools, and that the next training is in April, and that we are looking to get even more uh, staff and um, teachers trained, specifically our custodians, our athletic um, coaches, so we make sure that we have coverage during after school hours as well when the nurses aren't necessarily around. Um, we talked about a grant for radios. Um, the local, it was Westchester police officer um, recognized that we have poor cell coverage up here and that it's an issue. Um, long term, they're working on new cell towers and something called trunking. I don't know what that is, but in the short term, um, there's been a, uh, we've purchased uh, more radios for our security and administration within the buildings. So um, in case of emergency, we have guaranteed communications. And then uh, Liz talked about it a little bit, was got some bus driver training. They did, they're called tabletops where they practice scenarios. So the bus drivers feel really confident um, in um, making, being able to make decisions should an emergency arrive. So those were some of the highlights from this past month. When is your next uh, safety meeting? You know? Yeah, I just want to make sure that we yeah, get that before. Oh, oh no. yeah, not right now. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Any other? I have, a, I have a couple. Sure. So I have them written down because I didn't want to forget. By the time it gets to 9 30, 10 o'clock, I start to get yeah. where I forget. So there's a couple of big events coming up. Um, Ms. Boyle mentioned the one that's March 25th, but uh, the high school senior fashion show is next Friday. Um, March 10th at 730 in the high school gym. And that's the, me the members of the 2023 class will walk the runway in different outfits. Their theme is time work. There's raffles, concessions, a silent auction, student artwork. Um, there's an intermission performance by the cast of Mamma Mia. And their show is actually the following week, the 17th, 18th, and 19th. For the fashion show, the tickets are $20 adults, senior, senior citizens are 15, and the students are 10. Um, you can get them on the PTA page, PTSA Facebook page. Um, I just want to say that this uh, fundraiser is what how the PTA funds the senior awards that they get every year. Um, and it also, last year, they were able to help the kids with prom, and they they actually pushed past some funds down to the junior class as well because they were behind on fundraising because of COVID for not being able to. So. You know, this, this is the, um, it does benefit, we call it a senior fashion show because it stars as seniors, but it does benefit um, everyone. And after that, the Harlem Lizards are coming the next day. And I heard people find that the Lizards are visiting, the, I think, at least the elementary schools tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, which is so fun. I'm not sure if they're going to get the middle school, but I, they, I think they have been in the past, but definitely at the elementary schools, which is awesome. And their tickets are on sale, they're $20 to $60. And I think they're announcing the all-star team on Friday, which is fun. That's our head and head all-star team. Um, and you can buy tickets. I think we're getting, I was told we're getting an email Friday about this. So everyone look out for that. And then um, Mamma Mia tickets can be purchased on showticksforyou.com or .org. So there's a lot going on for our kids. Oh, and I, the Harlem Wizards is for HHDF, which is the Education Foundation, which goes to K-12. K Thank you, Adam. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? New business? Comments? Anything? No? All right. Can I have a motion to close the meeting? Mm -hmm. I have a second. All in favor? 